afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you to the organizers for asking me to speak on translating science to practice clinical perspective of generation two basal insulin. Um, the disclaimer is we are, I am contracted for this talk. Um, can we have the slides up here, please? Oh, <clears throat> okay. Thanks. Right, so Dr. Oni showed the data for in-range study and looking at CGMs and time in range has become important both from research perspective as well as in clinical practice. I'm going to take a step back and talk about the need for us to offer insulin to our patients in time, what is the impact of delayed, delayed insulin initiation, how does timely initiation with basal insulin benefit, and then moving on to talk about the benefits of generation two basal insulin. So Dr. Nish showed some of the benefits in terms of improved time and range profile, similar coefficient of variation. So essentially, no difference in variability between the two generation uh, uh, two basal insulins. And then some practical considerations for the use of this particular gen two basal insulin. Now let's start with understanding the impact of delayed insulin initiation. Landmark was the first longitudinal real-world evidence study from India, large-scale longitudinal prospective observational real-world study, which looked at the management and complications in type 2 diabetes across India over a period of three years. And this study was well represented across the country, as we can see here and appreciate 382 sites. You had um, good representation from across 31% from north, 36% from south, 14 from east, and 20% from the west of India. Now, what did this study highlight? That the fact is, four out of five people today in, in, in India with type 2 diabetes still remain uncontrolled. And that's what we've seen across the different epidemiological data as well. Patients achieving A1C less than 7%, 19.2, 22.3, so it's pretty much around that figure. Less than one in four Indians with type 2 diabetes take insulin therapy, and the average A1C when insulin is initiated still remains high at 9.2%. So in spite of advances, in spite of sessions like these, in spite of conferences and educational initiatives, we've not been able to change the, the, the practice trends of using insulin earlier on. Now delayed insulin initiation has its own consequences. As we can see from this data by Dr. Kamlesh Kunti and all, that whether it is, when you look at the time period when people are using a single oral drug, two oral drugs, or three oral drugs, the time before which insulin is initiated is on an average seven years. So there is a lot of inertia for insulin initiation and that persists across the spectrum of treatment, something which needs to change. Now why is this important? Because that initial period that we are losing out on, which is giving rise to bad metabolic memory has its own consequences. So the initial poor glycemic control, the hyperglycemia would lead to oxidative stress which will have its own issues through the nitric oxide pathway. At the same time, hyperglycemia will also lead to generation of advanced glycation end products, which will act onto the, the receptors for the advanced glycation end products. The neutrophilic factors, again, oxidative stress. This is some of the postulated pathways of high, how hyperglycemia or bad metabolic memory is leading to early complications in individuals with type 2 diabetes. Sometimes our patients ask us this question, is insulin better than oral medications? And we may not yet have the answer for that. In fact, a lot of evidence today may say that a lot of other group of drugs, as we understand today, be it SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor analogs, have shown a lot of other pleiotropic benefits and cardiorenal protection. So are, is necessarily insulin, bet, insulin better than these drugs? Maybe not. But nobody's taking away the fact that glycemic control or metabolic achievement control is extremely important. Whether we go back to DCCT, UKPDS, ADVANCE, and many other studies have, have shown beyond doubt that though we may talk about other factors today in preventing complications, glycemic management still remains the cornerstone of therapy for diabetes. And which is where insulin, as an agent which is most efficacious to bring down the glucose and improve HbA1c, still remains the cornerstone of therapy even in people with type 2 diabetes and that's the need that we don't need to shy away or keep waiting forever. If your oral medications are able to achieve control, wonderful. If not, don't keep dragging. The drawbacks of delayed insulin intensification were also seen from the EDIC study. EDIC was the follow-up of the DCCT study and this looked at the 
And in, in, in the DCCT, as you remember, that there were two arms, as it always used to be in the older trials. You always had an intensive glucose control arm and a conservative glucose control arm. So in the arm where intensification of insulin did not happen on time, and they were able to follow up these patients as part of the EDIC study, at the end of the six-year period, they found that the, where intensification did not happen, there was higher microvascular complications, including nephropathy, and there was higher myocardial infarction and other aspects of macrovascular complications, including increase in the carotid intimal medial thickness. So which is why the need for timely initiation with insulin, there hardly remains a doubt across the globe about when you, when you make that decision of initiating insulin, which is the nature of insulin that you will initiate with. Some of the local guidelines still talk about premix, and in a odd situation, you may still use or offer the advantage of premixes, but largely, even in India today and globally, it is the basal insulin which has been the norm and the preferred option. The early in initiation of insulin improves metabolic control. So this is an offshoot study from the UK PDS where Wright and all showed that in, as compared to conventional approach, in the other arm when insulin was used alone or where insulin was added to the oral drugs, essentially sulfonylureas, they found the early addition of insulin to the oral agent monotherapy maintained glucose levels below the target for another six year period. And which is where this sub-study from the UK PDS also drove home the fact that insulin along with orals is going to score far better than just orals itself. Or as some have read into it, better than just insulin itself, the combination may be better for patients with type 2 diabetes. So early initiation of insulin significantly improves the patient's chances of reaching the goal. The earlier traditional concept of stepwise treatment, waiting for your therapy to fail, always led to that time period when the patient is losing out on, on control. Today we understand that there is an absolute need not to lose out on that first few golden years. There is a need to have good metabolic memory, good glycemic legacy, and hence when you start insulin earlier and offer that treatment, the control is maintained and the complications are much lesser in the years to come. Be Smart was um, the, the, the another consensus group which came, it spoke about basal early strategies to maximize A1C reduction with oral therapy, which spoke about the, the need to again use the basal insulin along with oral therapies. The Be Smart guidelines had certain pointers which said basal insulin is the most convenient insulin, initial, insulin initial insulin regimen which you can start with 10 units per day or 0.1 to 0.2 units per kilogram depending on the degree of hyperglycemia. Timely insulin initiation leads to long-term reduction in complications. Basal should be injected at an appropriate time. Usually the choice is bedtime for the once daily basal insulins, but having said that, if your patient has some fear and prefers to use it in the daytime, it, it doesn't really matter. Basal insulin analogs do provide the advantage of flexibility, especially the, the second generation ones, making it simple and less intrusive or obstructive to the individual's life. And this is where we should also remember the factor of, of diabetes distress. I think one of the major goals when we manage our patients with diabetes is also keeping in mind the aspect of mental health and diabetes distress. Any decision of ours which is adding to the distress for your patient, you may bring down the A1C a little bit, but that's not going to help the patient in the long run. So the distress part has to be kept in mind. And of course, the Glargine 300 offers more flexibility in terms of the injection time and, and because it's a genuine long-acting insulin, a couple of hours here and there, plus minus, it doesn't matter. What to do with the other OEDs? I think that's very often a question that physicians ask, that yes, we are started. We are convinced we want to offer the benefit of basal insulin to our patient. What do we do with the orals? Do we stop it? Big mistake if you do that. So metformin could be continued unless there are specific contraindications to the use of metformin. Your incretin-based therapies, your SGLT2 inhibitors should be continued, again, unless specific contraindications. Use of glitazones can be there, but with caution. Glitazone, especially pioglitazone, that's the only one we use now with high dose and insulin can cause a lot of fluid retention, so you need to be cautious. Use of sulfonylureas could be continued. And this, I must say, is the sense that we as Indians and Asian Indians have put to our counterparts in the West. If you go back and see some of the guidelines, they were very clear that the moment you are starting insulin stops sulfonylurea. 
And that in a lot of patients would lead to disaster and extreme hyperglycemia. You go on increasing the insulin dose, go from once daily to twice daily and thrice daily. No. Continue with sulfonylurea. Only in rare chances that your patient is experiencing hypoglycemia would you bring down the dose or stop it. Or when you intensify your insulin and move from say basal to a basal plus or a basal bolus, you may consider that sulfonylureas are not that effective at that point and, and, and stop them. But it should not be a blanket um, rule that you follow. Benefits of early basal supported oral therapy, well basal insulin is capable of restoring residual beta cell function, takes care of your glucotoxicity, gives rest to the pancreas and this is extremely true for patients who are newly detected and see you with a high HbA1c. There is a lot of glucotoxicity. In my practice I continue to offer my patients who see me for the first time with an A1c higher than 11% and who have some symptoms the, the choice of using insulin for the first few weeks. The kind of rest it offers to your pancreas, it ensures that they require minimum medication and also the best chance, if any, of remission through their lifestyle changes. Early insulin at attenuates the risk of microvascular outcomes in participants with, with the baseline A1C, anything which is more than 6.4. Early basal insulin add-on lowers the risk of hypoglycemia and weight gain and is considered safe in high-risk cardiovascular patients as well. What about the benefits of the generation 2 basal insulin? So let's look at the evolution of the basal insulins. We have moved from NPH, which used to be the only basal insulin, had to be twice a day, was uh, an insulin which peaked, as we can see in the profile here. That it was one with a peak. And then you got glargine, which was considerably flatter, but probably not working for entire 24 hours, falling short by an hour. You also had detamide, which also had its own peak, but would not last really beyond 18 to 20 hours in many patients. And then you have the Degludec and Glargine 300, which are genuine long-acting flat insulins with lesser day-to-day -day variability. What is the difference between Glargine 300 and 100? Very often that, that's the question asked. So essentially it's smaller volume of injection for Glargine 300, it's a more concentrated insulin. So when you talk about U40, U100, U300, the difference is that in one ml of the fluid, how much insulin is concentrated? In U40, you have 40 units in U100, you have 100, in U300, you have 300 units in that same one ml of the fluid. So it's smaller volume, smaller and hence smaller subcutaneous depot for the Glargine 300. It hence leads to different absorption kinetics and that leads to more gradual and a flatter release and a flatter pharmacokinetic profile for Glargine 300. And as we can see here, that it is the lesser volume which also has other advantages less as lesser amount of fluid injected, lesser pain and so on. More stable and prolonged PKPD profile for Glargine 300 versus Glargine 100 uh, is, is the benefit for Glargine 300. What about the two different generation two basal insulins? What is the different profile was already shown by Dr. Unni and part of the in-range study. So if you compare Glargine 300 with 100, what it showed was better efficacy as well. Right? Between the Glargine 300 and Degludec, you did not see difference in efficacy. But when you compare to Glargine 100, in its, um, in its developmental program, the evolution studies, uh, Glargine 300 did show slightly better efficacy and of course far lesser hypoglycemia, um, both the nocturnal as well as the any time of the day hypoglycemia was lesser in the Glargine 300 arm as compared to Glargine 100. How do you switch from first generation to the improved Glargine 300? Um, well, it is switching is, is, is dose to dose. It's the ease of use. This does offer improved quality of life, lesser pain, lesser force to inject. And, and as again pointed out, because the cost today is no different for Glargine 300 also as compared to Glargine 100. It, there's just a minimal difference as compared to earlier and definitely lesser than the other generation 2 basal insulin. That ease and, and financial ease, if I may say, is also something which is welcomed by the patients. Advantages of generation 2 versus base generation 1, of course, definitely longer duration, better 24 hour coverage, greater administration time flexibility. The patient does not have to be regimental that I have to take it at 11 p.m. every night. Uh, one is out uh, for whatever reason, comes back later, takes at 12.31 before going to bed. The next day takes at 11 o'clock, previous day taken at 10 o'clock, it doesn't matter. Reduced glycemic variability can be easily titrated. The titration algorithms haven't changed. You very often start with 10 and then go plus 2, minus 2, targeting the fasting blood sugar. 
lower risk of hypoglycemia both anytime and nocturnal and definitely leading to more patient satisfaction and lesser weight gain. Finally, some practical considerations for this insulin. What is the initiation dose? Well, you could follow any of the means, 0.2 units per kilogram body weight, or still go for the conventional start with 10 units and then up titrate. What is the preferred time? Any time of the day, but usually around the same time, a couple of hours here and there. All OEDs can be continued unless specific contraindication. Titration regimen, you can do it once a week or, or twice a week, depending on patient's comfort and the SMBG frequency. Up to what dose can you titrate? Well, usually if you cross 0.5 to 0.6 units of these basal insulin per kilogram per body weight, and you are not able to get your patients to target, or if the fasting is in target and the postprandial is not, then there is no point in up titrating the basal. You will have to look at a bolus component or a shift to probably premix as well. What are the unique advantages of glargine 300 or, or the 100? I think plenty of those which have been highlighted already. What about the pen? It's built for accuracy and convenient dosing. Uh, it has all to its advantages, the ease of use, less volume, lower injection force, and so on in this disposable pen that it has. And also the reusable pen. Uh, again, the reusable pen for Glargine 300 has to be only for Glargine 300. Let's understand this is different volume. It has a different space. It's 1.5 ml with, with 300 uh, uh, units in that per ml. So total is 450 units in the cartridge. So there is a different pen for 300 and it should not be used for the other pens. There is a penalty-free dose correction. That means if you dial a particular dose by mistake, say 15, and you have to come back to 12, you can do that. So all these are advantages that the current devices offer, making it easier for the patient to use and increasing their comfort. So let me summarize by saying early insulin initiation is crucial to achieving effective glycemic control in patients with type 2, inadequately controlled on OAD, and don't keep waiting forever or for divine intervention. You need to intervene. Glargine 300 demonstrates superior glycemic reduction and is also reported as a convenient medication by both patients and physicians across various surveys. Glargine 300 has an array of advantages as compared to the earlier generation basal insulins and delay in treatment intensification may result in increased complications, something that we all must pledge to avoid. With that, let me thank you all for having me here and hand it back to the chairperson.